never give up. I never give up. I never give up. Hi guys, welcome back to my Steps of Sobriety, my show on YouTube and as a podcast with me, your host, Stefan Neff. Today I've got another fantastic interview. And today my guest uh, is has excited me uh, because she believes in exactly the same, the same principles, the core principles by which you can live a life that is so, so heading towards the person you truly want to be, maybe the person you deserve to be. And we both have been in our darkness. We both are now addicted to light. And therefore, it's such a fantastic interview coming up. So, ladies and gentlemen, Marsha von Weinsberg, welcome to my show. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, Marsha, it is wonderful. You are a woman who is uh, out there, who is going out there and trying to make this world a better place. You have worked on seven books. You have got two podcasts. You are a very prolific woman um, who clearly has found her voice. Um, but for most of us, we don't have a voice. Or the voice that, that is initially in us is evil bullshit. And it tells us so many lies. That's certainly true for me. How was mm. your story? Oh, there's so much in what you just said, and I agree. I mean, to be honest, it's usually the voice in our own head that is the problem. And most people are so afraid. I know this is a generalization, but I know I was here too. Most people are so afraid of using their voice, sharing, asking for help, reaching out, because they're constantly afraid of what others are going to think or say of them. And really, the most critical voice we all face is our own. It's, it's always our own. Yes. Other people will say like, people could say things to me all day long. I don't have to take it on. I don't have to carry it. It doesn't have to become my identity, but when I'm in a low spot and I'm not taking care of myself and I'm not taking radical responsibility for myself, those comments can sting in a really ugly way. So that becomes another eye opener for me of saying, okay, wait, what am I not doing for myself right now? What am I, like, why is that? person's words affecting me but I just wanted to start with that because that's the number one thing people say to me is I'm so afraid of what others are going to say and I often ask them what's the worst thing you've ever said to yourself and they will say the words I'm like now who else has said that to you and they're like oh nobody else talks to me that way and I'm like so who cares what other people are thinking and saying because I'm telling you the biggest critic you have is right inside of you <laughs> touche, touche. And my goodness, this this person inside of me is straight out of the Spanish Inquisition, not as far as physical violence is concerned, but certainly emotional violence. Mm -hmm. And it is hard. But we all have got this person. We mm -hmm. why? Why is there such um, an issue? I'm going to take it a little bit to NLP. So I'm a neuro-linguistic programming trainer and I teach people the basics of NLP. And one of the things is, is that, you know, our subconscious mind is responsible for 95% of what we think, do, say, choose, all everything that we do. So that's 95%. And that is our goal getter. Our goal setter is our conscious mind, which is responsible for 5%. And I think that we are all a living, breathing example of whatever we lived through from zero to seven years old. Like that's our subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. And we are continuously hustling for our worth to validate ourselves, to feel these things. And, 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 it, and you can have had like a mm -hmm. very incredible childhood. It's not necessarily what people say to you. It's what you perceive that they say. It's how you take those messages in. It's really, it really is what you perceive. Mm -hmm. And I, I know, I think one of the things that Joe Dispenza says is that most of our conversations after two years, we only remember 50% accuracy. Mm -hmm. So now think I'm in my fifties and I'm like saying, well, back when I was five years old, this is what happened. And I mean, that's I'm now <laughs> applying a conscious lens to something that I don't actually remember. So it requires a lot of subconscious work. I think that's one thing. And I think that we have all grown up in a culture of, you know, what's right, what's wrong, who's good, who's bad. Mm. And this, this, I think that, I think at deep down at the core, we want to be seen, heard, 
and validate it. And for some of us, we're hus- we've hustled for that for a long time. Mm-hmm. Now, the flip is, is, is that, I mean, I've also done a lot of work with mental health and you can give that to somebody they still might not receive it. Like you could turn and give all of the love and validation and support mm-hmm. to someone else. If they don't feel worthy of receiving it, then they won't. So you can still only do so much. I believe that the work comes from within us first mm-hmm. and that's the work that we have to do. So this is a great way to start the conversation, but I just, mm-hmm. I hope that that speaks. No, it makes a lot of sense. And because I've been pondering that, for, why the hell? And there is, there is another aspect. If you look at more where we have come from, let's, let's put uh, imaginary friends, i.e. religions aside. Um, mm-hmm. Let's, uh, let's say, okay, we all have been, our ancestors lived in small tribes of uh, 50, 100, 200 people. And mm-hmm. you had to be, uh, you had to be towing the line there. Um, if mm-hmm. you were doing stupid things, you were ostracized, you were thrown out of the tribe, which was a yes. death sentence. So therefore, mm-hmm. it is ingrained in us to think what will others think of us, because it was such an important survival 50, 100,000 years ago. So there is very much a, a genetic influence mm-hmm. there. Uh, plus, then of course, exactly what you have described, the the, the first seven years, which I can't remember. And this, I, there is very mm-hmm. little. I've got, I think, like one memory, or maybe two, and they were not nice memories. So, give you an example there. It's oh my god. So, well, so, they, yeah, subconscious mind is pretty interesting because you're if a lot of people can't remember, a lot mm-hmm. can't, and what happens is, is your subconscious mind, its job is to protect you from anything. Yeah. that is perceived as harm. And so there's a lot of us who don't remember some things because we, it was perceived as harm. But the challenging, the interesting thing is, is what your subconscious mind also does is that it suppresses it, but it also brings it up to the surface to you daily in a way of saying like, so if you're a person who says, you know, I'm like these limiting beliefs, these things keep coming up in my face every single day. And I don't understand why mm-hmm. your subconscious mind's job is to protect you. And its job is also to come forward and say, like, can you help me to release this? I don't know how to release this. I don't want to hold on to this. And so it's a really interesting dance of what your body is trying to do. We are meant to stay safe. We are meant to say like it, it in, we're not meant to, but we believe that we are meant to stay safe. We don't want to put ourselves out there. Yet the number one thing that they say humans crave is belonging and connection. Mm. Like we crave belonging and connection. Mm. And so if you're somebody who is going to step out and use your voice, you will be met with some challenges. And I, and I can, I can attest to that hundred percent. You will be met with some challenges. If the number one goal is to connect and belong with others, the second you get one of those comments, it's like, Ooh, that's scary. Danger, danger. I can't go there. When actually you have to remember that people's reaction to you is just their subconscious mind and and they're like you're you're pushing triggers within them the lens that they're that they're wearing is how they are perceiving you so you actually may not be doing anything wrong you just might be pushing a lot of buttons i mean i grew up in an era where like not only did we not talk about difficult things we literally shoved every single thing under the carpet you put a smile on you pretend like life is amazing <laughs> and it was like but what if it's not actually? Yeah, and so right. when I when I started to share, I rocked the boat because my generation was very much like we don't talk about these things. And I'm like, but that's how we got here. That's how we got here. So you have to be okay with rocking the boat a little bit because, and it's worth it. In my opinion, it's worth it because you can start to create so much change when you do that. Hmm. Oh, so true. So true. I think the other thing is that we need to realize that this world is is complex and mm-hmm. that there is so much trauma in many people's lives that that we all are running around like Puffloves the Puffloves dog where someone rings a bell and they start drooling yes. you think of food now this this could be literally food or like in food addictions or it could actually be uh the 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 hair the hair trigger of uh being a very angry person due to perceive well due to actual violence that has happened in their life etc so they they interpret everything differently so it is really perception 
of uh, and which is colored by our experience you're so beautifully um and then exactly. uh, lining that out i think there are so many things that we need to realize that um the other thing let's not be silly 10 percent of people do have a personality disorder so they are mm -hmm. hardwired to maybe be a bit more difficult the jerks mm -hmm. in 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 live quotation mark the people who will respond uh who don't have the same responses as you have um and who might take pleasure in um or have some kind of benefit in treating you not so nicely so here you go so unfortunately uh, you can be as nice as you want there will always be people who will try to to antagonize you torpedo you whatever and we need to accept that and that's where the resilience comes in isn't it oh 100 percent. i couldn't agree more i i mean i think it's it, if and it's a very fair statement to say the 10% and that, that maybe there are people that will really approach their, they don't, it's not about kindness. It's not about this, whatever. We've all seen it. I've seen people behave ways and I'm like, wow, that's just like, that's actually really nasty. Like, that's mm -hmm. actually really nasty. Mm -hmm. But then we can also choose if we go back into ownership, I can choose to put a hundred percent of my attention on that 10% of the purse of the, of the responses. Ooh. And what am I going to do then ignore the 90% Ooh. who have said, thank you for showing up and sharing. Because if, if I'm going to do that, then that's my choice, right? Ooh. That's I, I'm making a choice there. Very nice. I like, I like, <laughs> you like the lot. spin. Oh yeah. Well done girl. Um, I think it is, that is so important. And I think that is where, that is where in, in, in my life, gratitude has become such quite a powerful way, a powerful skill um, to, for me to turn things around. And it takes me about, I'm lucky, I'm in, in Rotorua in New Zealand, it takes me about 10 minutes, 12 minutes to get to work. But sometimes I go in the car and I'm ready, you're ready to rip someone's head off. And by the time I end up at the end of my cul-de-sac here, uh, then I start, okay, no, no, I don't want that. I don't want to be like that. So I say, I'm happy and grateful. And I speak it out loud. So if someone watches me driving and I talk out loud, <laughs> pretend that I'm on the phone or something like that. It's me doing gratitude. <laughs> I'm happy and Where grateful. Oh, exactly. I'm happy and grateful that... And then I say whatever first comes in my mind. I'm happy and I force myself to keep talking. By the time I've come down my hill there, kilometer, two kilometers, I already feel a bit better. By the time I roll into the car park at work, there's a smile on my face, a true, honest mm -hmm. smile on my face, because I have so overpowered the negative, angry, idiot me um, with gratitude that I can actually start again and actually start mm -hmm. again that morning. And that is, and an, it sounds stupid, guys. And the first time you do it, you sound so false. And your your own ears will say, they cringe. They are. Uh, but guys, try it. I mean, this is such a beautiful thing. If you actually learn a skill where you can turn your life around there and then change your physical state. Now that's power. It's huge power. And I love that story. Thank you for sharing that. Because I think that, um, I mean, gratitude is the highest vibration you can have. Like you mm. can't have gratitude and anger, like true gratitude mm. and feel the other emotions at the same time. Mm. And I just want to share, like, if you're listening to this and you're like, okay, well, how do I find gratitude when I, like my life is a mess right now. And there, there was a time where I had people say to me, you just have to start a gratitude journal. And I'm in my head going, did you hear what my life is right now? Like, I like, yeah. are you kidding me? Like exactly. I couldn't even, it just seemed ridiculous. Um, so I actually just, and I think I just want to encourage anybody find your way mm -hmm. for your gratitudes. For me at the end of the day, I would like sit in moments of where were my wins? What did I do? How did yeah. I like, did I, you know, I drank my water today. I went out for a walk today. I listened to what I need today. I, and, and because what happens is the practice of gratitude brings you back to the present moment. Mm. When you're in trauma, we tend to spend all of our time replaying the past mm. or stressing about the future. The present is a place we don't want to go to. Mm. And so gratitude brings us back here, which allows us to recognize that what can we control and what can we not control? And so it really is, it's, if you're listening to this and you're like feeling this level of resentment about gratitude, find your way to get there. It's a very powerful practice to do it. 
it's just when it's really hard, it's hard to find your way. So I had to do little, little, tiny, tiny baby steps. Like they were so baby that I got to the point that my mindset started to change and then it got easier. I 100% agree, 100% agree. And guys, remember, if you go the first time after a long time into a gym or do any kind of exercise, my goodness, even the smallest dumbbell looks like an over, overwhelming kind of effort. And then after six months, you're throwing these weights around as if there's no tomorrow um so it's the same with gratitude it's the same with any survival skill that you are new to and are beginning to learn and play with uh once you have done uh 100 repetitions uh, it's much easier once you've done it a thousand times uh yeah by ten thousand times you're a master but every mm -hmm. single time that you actually try it and every single time that you use it you get a little bit stronger and it gets mm -hmm. a little bit easier so therefore, don't shy away. And even if you are not perfect with it, and no doubt you will not be perfect, you have done something. You've taken action. Yeah. You're no longer the victim. You actually chose to do that. And, and right now, we have to say, anyone listening, you have already taken action. You are mm -hmm. here doing something. Exactly. Wow. Welcome to us. Welcome to the tribe of, we are not survivors, we are thrivers. Uh, but exactly. we have been victims. I have been such a victim and I'm so resentful, angry. Arr, that was the past. And from now on, then I still dip my toes a little bit into that dirty pond. Um, because it's so easy to be the victim. And it's so easy because the world is a piece of shit. In the last three years, there's nothing easy has come to us. I mean, for you, same story, isn't it? Um, it's you had very to, much the same. Yeah. You reinvented yourself, in fact, over the last three years. Um, mm -hmm. uh, COVID has got that kind of influence on people, isn't it? <laughs> it Tell us it a bit is, about your is, journey. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even when you talk about the last three years, that was definitely something. I mean, I was I worked as a registered kinesiologist for 28 years. I worked full time. Um, I gave a lot to clients and, and I really helped some clients even learn how to walk again. So I was very much a giving, mm -hmm. um, giving job. And I kept feeling like I, I felt like this is a one-to-one -one job. I felt like I could do one-to-many. Like I felt like I could do something more. Mm -hmm. um, in the last two years before COVID happened, I was like, okay, I feel like I'm supposed to leave my job, but I don't know exactly what that's going to look like. And then wow. of course, the how is not up to us. And the, it, when, when it was done, I mean, it didn't come back for almost six months. And so I remember the very next day I came home, I was like, my job is done March 17th. And I woke up early the next morning and I started, I remember my husband coming in going, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, this is the time I prayed for. I've got to figure out how to use this time. Like this was like, the, the, I'm going to use this time. And he's like, okay, it's so like the next day. And I'm like, yeah, this is time. I need this time. And it was just my mindset. And that's the mindset thing. Whereas I had a lot of friends, no shame at all. But I had a lot of friends who like literally watched Netflix straight through right from the beginning. And I was like, what if this is the time I asked for to yeah. figure this out? Yeah. I didn't want to have a regret. That was a big thing. And so I really just punkered down and tried to learn really took my podcast further. And during that year, I was prepping, I didn't know it, but I was prepping for back surgery. I had a complete re reconstructive back surgery during the pandemic, not recommended, <laughs> five days in the hospital, like rods, screws, you name it. And I remember being in the hospital at that point and saying, okay, you're being asked now to learn how to do this differently. Like you're being asked to slow down, pay attention. Cause I had to, I had to learn how to walk. Like I had to learn how to walk again. And I just went, this is what you're being asked to do. And so I really put my head down. I started to really dive into NLP, neuro-linguistic programming, really seeing where I was not taking the time to heal from mm -hmm. some of my past stories, because I'm just the person who puts her heads down, head down and just goes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a point where I was like, I think my body's asking me to just slow down and do this a little bit differently this time. Mm -hmm. And so that's really when, you know, my business continued to grow, but I started to really change how I approached it. And that was probably about eight years overdue or 50 years overdue, whichever way you want to look at it. <laughs> 
I could not agree more. Yeah. And that is actually an amazing, amazing realization. Now you are like me. I mean, that's that's scary. Um, <laughs> you are basically okay. Here is something I need to do. Let's do it right now. You're a fixer oh, yeah. as far as that is concerned. Yeah. Um, having said that. Um, to everyone out there who spent a considerable amount of time on the couch, I want to congratulate you too. Because most yeah. of us have been on the treadmill. Uh, and with that, I mean more the hamster wheel, the, the kind of crazy, just go, 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 go. And then disaster struck, in this case, COVID. In my line of work as an anesthetist, I see a lot of uh, a lot of men, typically, who have been working very hard, who are doing just everything they are they they know they want to do they think they have to do you know the provider role the men and women here are working their guts out um mm -hmm. in my environment and then something happens they're hardworking, handyman people and then they damage their shoulder and that's when they start meeting me and mm -hmm. um they are suddenly they are suddenly forced to stop and for them it's it's chaos they, they go nuts um, mm -hmm. they, they think they are failure, all these negative emotions come out and I try to reframe it for, for my, my, the people that uh, I have the privilege of anesthetizing to say, Hey, look, man, when was the last time that you had six weeks holiday? Okay. When was the last time that you looked after yourself? Mm -hmm. And if that, and that means also having a rest and taking some time out. So guys, if right now you spend 18 hours, um, just curled up in a ball, Hey, Maybe that is just what you need to do um, to actually just conserve the energy and and just be the be that person. But we want to entice you to think that yes, it's okay from now and then to to have a pity party, but mm -hmm. that's not really where life is. That's not really mm -hmm. where 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 you grow. Um, all that shit that is out there happening to us, I believe it has a purpose. Uh, mm -hmm. it, and and I I use it as uh, as exactly that. Even if that the hardest things hit me, um, it is it is still there. I know I will grow. I will be a stronger man afterwards. Um, however shitty the time right now is. Um, so let's let's not forget that, okay, guys? Because Marsha, you were saying earlier, hey, look, when you are in the depth of the darkness. And and someone says do gratitude or do anything, mm. um, it's insurmountable. So and now don't add that that kind of shame and guilt. Oh my god, I'm a failure because I can't even do anything. And then it gets mm -hmm. even worse. Don't compound it. But mm -hmm. what would you say to people um, if they if they have been down and out, and things are really looking tight um, financially, emotionally? Uh, marriages have been broken, um, or indeed domestic violence uh, has raised its ugly head. Um, mm -hmm. What would you tell a man or a woman in such a situation? There's a lot of situations there, and it's a great question. Um, I think that we have to be able to stop and go internal and ask ourselves the really hard questions. What is working? What's not working? What do I want? Like, what do I want? Is this what I want? Um, is this what I don't want? Um, we have to be able to recognize that, I mean, every decision that we make brings us to this point that we are at today. If we want to go somewhere differently, we need to make different decisions. We're humans, <laughs> and myself included, <laughs> where humans screw up is between saying, okay, this is how I got to here, mm. and now I have to make different decisions to go over here. We uh, don't go into making different decisions. We stop and we replay everything we've screwed up. We literally like, like, look at me. I've done all this wrong. I've done all these things wrong. Like, we're, those aren't action. Those are victim. And I mean, I... There's a reason I know the victim mindset so well. I don't ever pretend that I was not. I knew it. I lived it. That's where I was. Um, but no change happens there. And so you have to get to a point of saying, okay, we allow ourselves those times and call it pity party, call it rest, call it whatever. But it's okay to have that. Mm. But we we are the only people who can decide, is this what I want for my life? right now or do i want something differently and if i want something differently what is like one thing that i can do to change 
today, like one small, because mm-hmm. I think we overestimate the small things that we have to do. Like we overestimate what it takes for us to create change when those small things can start to really add up. So I think that if you can do that and not look back, only look back to be able to say like, what have I learned so that I can maybe not do those same mistakes again Mm -hmm. and really get quiet with yourself and what that looks like. Because I had to do that a few times through those years and it was really tough. Mm -hmm. And I had to recognize that it's like, I'm not quitting on everyone else. I'm choosing me and I have to find a way to choose me during this process. Mm -hmm. And a lot of moms and parents go, yeah, but that's hard with little kids. It is hard. It's all hard, but we always get to choose our hard, right? Like we get to choose which one hard we want. And so I think we have to be able to look at that and not shame ourselves and say, what is one thing I can do today? And then the other thing I would think is really important is that how can you find some kind of support. And I mean, your support might actually, I'm going to, I can say it's not that it actually, it might be best that it isn't somebody that you know really well, Mm. because when we're getting that advice from the people who are closest in our life, um, sometimes that's like, they're used to you being here. Mm. When I first started to really create some growth and change, I was in a number of different social media groups, like Facebook groups. I'd gone to counseling. I'd gone to support people outside of my immediate circle. Mm. And it helped me to give some different perspective of what can I do differently. And then I would come back and I would share with some people close in my life. And they're like, well, that's crazy. You can't do that. Like, look at what's happening in your life. Like, because people want you to stay where you are and not everybody, not everybody wants to see you soar and grow. And, and, and that's okay, right? That's okay. We're not judging anything here. We just have to recognize that when you decide to move forward in your life and create change, A, you deserve it. You totally deserve it. You deserve more in your life. You have to believe that. And B, you have to know that the people that you can have the most impact with and the people who can have impact on your life, maybe you haven't met them yet. Like maybe you haven't even met them yet. So stop judging just the people in your space. That's what was one of my biggest eye openers is I had people leave in the ugliest way. And I remember going like, I feel so alone. I feel so alone. And then all of a sudden I would meet somebody in a Facebook group who's still one of my closest friends to this day. And Mm. she was feeling alone. We were connecting. And I'm like, wait, what if every time somebody leaves, somebody incredible comes in? How's that story? I want to buy into that one. And that really started to change it. So I know there's a lot of points there, but hopefully that gives something to anchor on and be able to create change. Hell yes. I love it, uh, what you just said there. And that was exactly my journey. Um, We know it that we know in the the recovery world, when you stop drinking, you lose a lot of so-called friends. What you're really losing is, is, uh, drinking buddies or, or people who were either leaning on you or supporting you for their own gains or, or, Mm -hmm. or, um, so good on them for going. So I've lost (laughs) a lot of those kind of people. Um, Mm -hmm. I gained, new people and you have to think that once you change when you, once you you start living intentionally you change and therefore you attract different people uh okay. often enough people you need there and then to help you through that new part of your journey but it's a bit okay. like lord of the rings hopefully you all have seen that beautiful mm-hmm. beautiful masterpiece so frodo he just doesn't one day say oh here's the ring over there is the mountain okay throw it in done finished five minute video um so tiktok <laughs> no he does yeah exactly tiktok <laughs> so he goes on a journey and he meets all kind of beings on the journey some of them not so nice some of them really close friends mm-hmm. and allies in his quest um it is i see recovery from addiction or recovery from severe trauma as exactly the same thing the first year out of rehab i was an empty shell. I then Mm -hmm. started reinventing myself. Mm -hmm. Um, And I learned the power of choice. And that's where you are so strong on the to be, uh, to be holding yourself accountable and holding yourself uh, responsible for every Mm -hmm. choice that you're making for every second that you have, because every second you can make a new choice. 
I mean, mm-hmm. what what an what an ability, what a what a privilege that we actually could now choose. Hey, I can listen to that to that podcast, or I could scroll just Instagram, or I could maybe listen to all the the, the news um, that is really bringing me down and telling me how mm-hmm. bad everything is. We have choices, and I love that. How did you, when did you develop this, this kind of taste for living intentionally, living in this moment? Well, it took a long time. I'm not going to lie. It definitely took a long time. It was not an easy road. Um, it was not. I, I mean, I was a parent, I dealt with teen substance abuse and I spent my, I mean, I feel like a lot of, I'm just going to use moms as an example because I am one. We feel like we signed this unwritten contract that it's our job to fix, manage, control, and keep everything smooth running nonstop. I don't know. We didn't sign it, but we believe that we did. And speaking of like the the meanings of things coming back to us, and that's, I think, some of those messages are things that have landed throughout generations. And so I spent a lot of time trying to manage everything around me and fix it. And I often say that, you know... I was a fighter as a kid. I was a very outspoken. I was very outspoken as a kid. And in the seventies, that was very much frowned upon, right? Like that was, that was definitely frowned upon. Um, So I didn't never really fed the box well, but I learned from a young age how to um, be able to control things and push things hard enough into myself. So let me give an example. Like, I think I actually was a very, I'm sure I have a learning disability. I wasn't ever diagnosed then. Um, but I worked so hard to get myself through high school, through oh. university, like this perfectionist type attitude. And so those were strengths for a long time. They And I think our strengths can only take us so far. But I do think there comes a point in time when our strengths become our weakness. And that's what happened to me is, is that I was taking that approach to fix, manage, and control everything that was completely outside of my control. And what was happening is, is I was burning and burning and burning. And it was like, yeah. this is not working. And so during those years, when I was creating some change, and I was really, you know, I was doing counseling and support and crisis counseling and um, podcasts and books, because that's really all I could afford to do. I was understanding, you know, and learning through Tony Robbins, the power of my words and my language. And I was like, okay, wait, these no wonder I feel stuck. That's the only word I keep saying how can I change this? Like, how can I change this? And it was like, wait, so I am taking all of my energy and I am owning everyone else's choices. And I'm so pissed off that I have nothing left for me. And actually it was completely ass backwards. I had to find a way to make myself a priority first, Mm. own my own choices, stop blaming everyone else for where my life was at and yeah. not try it and manage to control everyone else. And so it wasn't a smooth, easy road, but that was literally, I would, I started, there would be a point in time where it was like, is that my choice? Nope. Is that my choice? Nope. Like, wow. <laughs> what it, like what in here is actually my choice. And then I started to really understand like what was my choice and own my choice and take responsibility and let go of things that aren't mine. And eventually it hit a point that, you know, learning how to do that, but without the angry, like trying to prove it to somebody else and trying to like, that was just wasted energy. It just got to the point where it was like, that's not my choice. You don't like how that's turning out. Well, that's not my choice. You make a different choice and not shaming anybody, but just saying, just make a different choice, make one different choice, make another different choice, keep, keep, keep with the different choices. And so when I really started to do that work, own your choices, own your life, literally saved my life. Like they, they still, most people know me for talking about stories. They know me for talking about owning your choices because when you can be in a space of ownership and radical responsibility, it's amazing what you can, can, you can change in your life. It really is amazing. And so I took that fighter person in me for all those years and I let her go. And I just started to take ownership for what was mine and when things would blow up or there were problems, I'd be like, okay, it's not my choice. That was not my choice. And I'm going to own my choices. And that's what I'm going to focus on. Yeah. And that was how that everything stacked to create change. I mean, it took a lot of years of practice. It really did. I don't want anyone, like, as you're describing um, your year, first year in um, at, after rehab, 
like that's how in a way how I felt like my life was I was very much isolated I was very alone and I had to find my way and what did I want around me Mm -hmm. and I think that when we start to value ourselves more Mm -hmm. then we choose more valuable relationships too, like people who get access. So I used to, I created in my own mind, I mean, I had to survive, right? So I created in my own mind, what I called my inner circle and my inner circle was an invite only space. Nobody got access. (laughs) And I would even say it, it's an invite only space. This is how I am because I was not trying to thrive. I was trying to survive. I was trying to Uh. make it through one more day. Exactly. And so this had to be gold. And so I even uh, said that to family once. I was like, no, 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 you don't get access. It is not access because of blood. It is an invite only. And your behavior right now, I'm not inviting you in. It's just, it's not personal, but I'm not inviting you in. Because I I actually protected that like it was gold. And honestly, I really believe that mindset is what saved me. And these are sometimes the hard uh, times, especially when you have beco- uh, when you had been living in codependent relationships where basically you were you were a people pleaser you were there whatever label you put yourself yeah. you you give yeah. yourself um we have got these these kind of tendencies and then what happens you have you come to a point you're burned out and you get really pissed off with others yep. i've been yep. given so much of my time i've been here for you and what are you doing and it's that kind of oh my god sounds familiar <laughs> my it does for so, me. <laughs> so much so i actually i actually believe everybody should read codependent no more to be honest even i think every single person should read it because when my counselor recommended it, i'm like i am not codependent that's ridiculous and i like literally got to page two and i'm like oh crap like i am i i am i didn't even know it and it really is so in the interesting thing when two people own a problem and two people are codependent yeah. nobody owns it nobody uh, owns it if nobody owns it nobody changes it nothing yeah. happens so you have to plus humans yeah. we don't ever create change unless there's a consequence and so if there's mm-hmm. no consequence because there's no ownership then there's no change that happens oh i like that i like that mm-hmm. um and and maybe if, if if what we're talking about is a bit vague i give you an example from uh choco willink uh he is a u.s navy seal and he uh, love him that, that's why extreme ownership is his book and he says that uh his principle extreme ownership refers to that whatever happens um you are responsible for it and not in a sense of beating yourself up. Oh my God, no. things went wrong. No, but rather that you actually say, okay, if someone underneath me in my chain of command uh, did not perform the job well, then I have to ask myself, did I train him right? Did I give him the right tools? Did I give him the right information uh, to perform his his job? If someone above me stuffs up, then I have to say, well, did I give that person the right information with regards to making the decisions that are necessary? So Mm -hmm. however you look at it, without blaming, without uh, being nasty to yourself, especially, um, what was your role in that? And if there is something you can do better next time, well, that's Mm -hmm. worthwhile focusing on and learning Mm -hmm. from, because we all fuck up. We all are, (laughs) please. I mean, the amount of times a day that I make mistakes. Oh, yeah. Okay. When I say mistakes, um, things that with hindsight, I think uh, I could have done better. Um, Mm -hmm. Loads, loads. But that's normal. But I do no longer beat myself up for it. Um, From now on, then I I laugh. (laughs) I think, what? What have you just done? <laughs> so I use I use depreciating humor, and I allow myself that uh, self depreciating. Okay, so I, I I can tell myself with a smile on my face, you idiot. Uh, and oh, that's, I'll take I, that. Same, same. I can do that. I literally can. I stop and I'm like, wow, that was not your best self. What were you doing there? What was happening there? That's and a- I will stop and look at it and go, oh, you know what? I haven't given any time for myself this week. All the things that helped me to feel better, I haven't done them. I haven't right. made them a priority. I haven't done these things. And I'm like, wait, whose fault is that? That's mine. Right. How do I? Okay. <laughs> Let's get in the calendar. Where can I put that next week? And it's a reflection, right? It's a all reflection. Right. So when when I see myself acting that way, and it happens all the time, yeah. trust me, I'm not even going to pretend. 
happens all the time. And when it does, I'm like, wait, okay, what am I not doing right now? And it's like, oh, I'm usually not asking for help. I'm usually falling back into victim mindset. I'm usually Mm -hmm. like, I'm going right backwards with the things that I know they don't work, but I'm still, that's, that's, see, we all have defaults. We all have defaults that we go back to. Mm -hmm. Our job is to catch ourselves when we go that way. And it's like, wait, am I actually, is that the way I want to go? Because I remember a very turning point quote for me was Stephen Covey. I still refer to it all the time is that we're not a product of our circumstances. We're a product of our decisions. Mm. And that was a moment where I went, okay, wait, I can actually choose to do something with this. I can choose Mm -hmm. to do it differently. Mm -hmm. And that put me back in that ownership piece. So when things aren't going smoothly, I usually stop and go, Mm. okay, what are you not doing that you Mm. know you need right now? And there's always a list. There's Mm. always a list. Mm. And sometimes it, it is to give myself a day off, have a nap, watch Netflix and just chill out. Like it doesn't have to be more work. I think Correct. that's been one of my biggest learnings mm. in my fifties is it doesn't have to be more work. I think I am, it's taken me decades to learn how to listen to what I need and to not shame myself and to honor myself for what I need. hundred percent. Love it. Absolutely love it. There are other times when I feel full of anxiety. And it's mm-hmm. just, you know, it is, it's all quite nice to say, no, focus on now when really your brain is screaming uh, and it's you, all the cortisol and all the, the adrenaline or adrenaline is raising through your veins and mm-hmm. <laughs> you feel yourself hyperventilating. Um, do you get moments like that? Do you get? Um, uh, every day. <laughs> Every day, I'm okay. not even gonna. I've been. I'm not even every day. So, and I. What, what, what is that. your What is your technique? What What do you do when that happens? So I've built a toolbox. I have a toolbox, is and and my toolbox is like I know. I mean, I walk probably six to six eight k a day with mm-hmm. my dog. I work out every day. I do probably a breath work. Mm-hmm. and a hypnosis mm-hmm. on a regular basis. Right. Um, when anxiety comes up, I actually really get clear on, do I need more boundaries on social media? Do I need to return any messages? What do I actually need to get done right now? Nice. And I do, like, sometimes it's, I have things that I add in, but there's also things that I take away. Mm-hmm. And I just give myself permission that it's like, you know what, I need a day. I need a day to just recharge. Mm-hmm. And so I feel those feelings every day. They, they show up on a regular basis. Um, and I just really double down on what I need. And sometimes I need more mm-hmm. of that toolbox and that's okay. It's not a sign of weakness. And sometimes I have to stop and ask for help. And sometimes what I think is really important today is like, it will be fine next week. Things will wait. Like the, the things that we make up in our mind about what has to be done right now. I mean, does it really like, does no. it really, really? And, and so we have to, I say this with love, but we are often the source of our own anxiety. Yep. And it's because we're already anticipating. I love this part. If I just want to share, we're already anticipating what could go wrong in the future. And A, that's A, what could go wrong in the future. And B, how am I going to respond when that happens? Meanwhile, there's (laughs) 10,000 variables before that ever happens. And I can tell you that the worst experiences of my life, like the absolute worst that I would never wish on another parent I couldn't have read and prepped about. I had to make a decision in the moment. I had to deal with something in the moment. I didn't have time to open up a book and plan. So all of that energy that we're planning for the future, we will figure it out. We are more equipped than we think. So sometimes I just literally will have a moment. I'm like, just breathing. I'm like, Marcia, you're safe. Like we're safe. It's this focus on what can you do now? And don't even underestimate the power of breath work where Mm. you can do, you know, Three to five minutes of breath, breath work will completely put you into your um, parasympathetic nervous system, slow yourself right down, your brain and body go, okay, we we are safe. Okay, we're okay. And you can take a better head to a problem than to try and push through in your fight response when that's not going to work for anybody. So I have just really learned, again, it's taken me decades. It absolutely has taken me decades to learn to slow down, listen, get present, and then look around and see what actually has to be on my list right now. What can go? What can I add? And how can I honor what I need right now? But once you have mastered that little trick, those, those, the part of your toolbox uh, that you've just described, 
That is true power. Imagine Serena Williams standing there, ready to serve, and you see her bouncing mm -hmm. that freaking ball. She bounces the bloody ball. Um, you see the same with any kind of sportsman. They put themselves into a zone. In mm -hmm. fact, Marsha and I this morning, we had a, some some gremlins in our in our recording there. So we were both a little bit frazzled there um, to, to get things sorted. But uh, what I did is basically we said, okay, now 10 seconds pause. And in those 10 seconds, I certainly- I saw that. A breathing exercise, calmed yeah. myself down. And because I'm practicing that, I'm using that, I'm now good in it. So therefore it was actually no issue for me. So within 10 seconds, I got myself into a different state. Uh, you did. And it was, it's a powerful, beautiful thing. So yes, it takes practice. Uh, but it is well worthwhile persevering um, to develop these kind of tool sets because not every tool will work in every situation. There are mm -hmm. times when you just can't do a bit of a nice deep meditation in a in some kind of yoga pose when you're in the middle of a boardroom meeting or when you're in the middle of a of a presentation. Um, I mean, you can try. I, I think you might be surprised actually when when half of the other people say, you know, we need a break too. Come on, let's mm -hmm. meditate. <laughs> now that would be a nice outcome. D don't try it immediately. Don't work on yourself <laughs> first. <laughs> so, so now it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. What I always say is uh, the power of compound interest. If you're uh, investing and put money aside, then your money will work for you. And um, so you've got a bit of interest in the first year, and then you put the same amount in. And now the, it's not just one plus one, but it's one plus one plus interest. And if you actually do that in over a period of time, you will be amazed how good your finances look like. Imagine you're doing the same in a garden. I call it a five-minute gardener. If every day from now on, you will spend five minutes in your garden, never more, never less. And just pull out some weeds. Tomorrow you put some seeds in. Tomorrow you prune a shrub. Cool. Can you imagine that after a week you see a difference? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that after a month you your family thinks, oh, our garden looks nice. And after three mm -hmm. months, I assure you, there are going to be tour buses coming around your fence, slowing down, showing the gardeners in, in your city uh, what cool, uh, how cool a garden could look like. Mm -hmm. Imagine you do the same now with a relationship. Maybe a oh, relationship, okay. a relationship with yourself. Five mm -hmm. minutes just with yourself. Getting to know that weird person there inside you. Or the, the multiple persons. <laughs> the victim, the thriver, the survivor. How cool mm -hmm. would that be? Man. It, oh. it would add up a lot more than you think. It's a, I heard a podcast the other day and they said, um, one of the questions was that how, how is it that like whatever we consider successful, people do these things, right? Like they might exercise, they do breath, breath work, they do whatever they're doing, whatever you consider that is. And it's like, how is it that all successful people do those things on a daily basis or regular basis? Mm. Are they just born motivated? And the interviewer said, no, they they don't like it just like anyone else, but they've just built habits around it. And I exactly. was like, oh my God, that is just such a good, yeah. it's just such a great message. It's not because people will say all the time, it's easy for you. And I'm like, no, no. The fact that you tell yourself it's easier for me is the reason that you're holding yourself back. Cause you think I have something different that you don't, you, that's not true. It's not true. It's just, I actually just got so tired of where my life was that I knew I had to create change, right? Because I didn't want to stay where I was. No. And so the other example is like most people are literally living their worst case scenario because they'll say, well, if I do this and this, if I don't like my job here and I leave and I go to do something else that I like and what if that doesn't work, what do I do then? And mm. it's like, well, could you go back to the first job that you had? Yes. So you're already living your worst case scenario. Like we paint the worst picture and we think that I can't make these things happen. And we, a lot of us assume that it's okay to be miserable. I hate what I'm doing. And this is, I guess this is just what my life is. I guess this is just mm. what it is. And that's not ownership either. So, mm. I mean, it's bad things happen to good people all the time. Like it's, please know that they do happen, but it's what do you do with it? That is, is the difference. And I can say, 
I've probably interviewed 400 people. Easy, Mm -hmm. easy. They've all walked through unbelievable stories. And when I ask them, like, what lesson in life are you most grateful for? Almost every single one of them has said Mm -hmm. what I walked through, the story that I've lived, the challenges that I had. It's made me who I am. So it is possible. I'm telling you, people can come to that space and mindset. And I'm talking like horrific stories that I would have never, ever expected So it is possible to move through and create change. It just takes a lot longer than some people think. And it requires a lot of work and consistency and, you know, repetition. And sometimes we just quit before we're even seeing any gains. Beautiful. It is. But I think we have got the the power right now of the moment. And if we just... Mm -hmm. We take one thing from this interview today. It's our power of choice and our power of choice of focusing on here right now. Um, Sometimes when I, when I'm very anxious, I force my, I I get, I get paralyzed at times. Yep. So do I. Literally Mm -hmm. analysis paralysis. Ah, Uh, and Mm -hmm. no, I, I force myself to break any task that is there into minute steps. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I'm so overwhelmed. I can't cook tonight. Uh, Well, okay. Let's open the fridge. Creak. So that's a take action. Okay. Oh, there's actually that. Oh, that's already prepared. Oh, okay. And, and by actually forcing myself to take one tiny little step after the next, suddenly I find myself becoming a bit calmer and a bit calmer. Mm. And by the time suddenly I've taken a number of little steps, um, then suddenly that I realize that anxiety is sort of ebbing away. And I mm. think that's so powerful. Um, knowing, getting to know your, your body and your psyche, getting to know an anxiety attack that it typically lasts a few minutes. And mm-hmm. then typically your your hormones are or your your neurotransmitters are calming down. Um that any kind of nasty negative emotion will go away because it's again it's waves in an ocean and you might uh you might be in the ocean and there's this wave coming and you can't get really angry about this wave i hate you wave don't you dare come near me (laughs) guess what the wave is still coming coming. exactly (laughs) you might as well learn either to surf or to body uh, to to bodyboard or to dive underneath the wave or just let yourself being tumbled around and Mm -hmm. accept the power of the wave um this is these are all things these are choices that you've got and we Uh, And sometimes it's just that realization that there are waves of shit coming towards us, tsunamis of shit. And you think, oh, my God, but they will pass. And I think Mm. that is the most important thing. So don't make permanent decisions based upon temporary waves of something. Okay. So so well said. Seriously, so well said. I love how you said that. And I, I, I really feel like... You know, one really tiny, simple thing is I, I even remind myself this still on a regular basis, like every choice, every decision I make is going to move me closer to or further away from where I want to go. Mm. And so it's not a shame. It's not a criticism. It's like, OK, the decision that I'm making today, I'm going to do my walk. I'm going to do this, whatever that is. Is that going to move me closer to or further away from where I want to go? Mm. And you might have those days where the decisions are going to move you further away. And that's okay because we're human. Mm. But if I'm going to do that for 30 days a month for, you know, ever, like eventually the where I want to go, I'm just going to keep moving further away from. That's so true. Marsha, you're an amazing woman. Uh, it's I could talk with you actually for hours here because we do bounce things around. And it's just it's just so lovely how we reframe or rephrase something. And suddenly mm-hmm. both of us go for a moment. Huh. Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. It's beautiful. That's how we grow. Now, Marsha yes. and me have never met each other before. We met in this this morning for this interview. But here we are. We have created a connection and that is that is palpable. That is beautiful. That has enriched certainly my life this morning. It's made me reflect, made me, made me uh made me appreciate the the power of the moment. Uh, and I will live a better life today. 
So guys, you are hopefully getting the same vibe. You're getting the same uh, the same uh, energy coming through because this is what propels you forward. So whatever at the moment happens in your life, it happens for a reason. You Many of the things you can't control, but you can control right now what you will do. So for example, you could go down there to like and subscribe this video. Now that would be a good start. You could, of course, also check out the show notes because that is where you get all the information on, on Marsha. But Marsha, tell us, I mean, you are, you are uh, constantly reinventing yourself. You are growing, you're expanding, you are thriving, literally. So tell us a bit, what are your current ventures and where people can find you? Mm, well, thank you so much again for having me. I've loved this conversation. And this is the beautiful part about podcasting, right? You connect with total strangers and you just connect and, and you feed off of each other. And I loved it. So my I've made it very easy social media wise to find me because my name is long and I go by Marsha Van W online. So everything like if you go to Google and start typing Marsha Van W, it's all going to come up. Um, that's where you can find me on any social media or my website. And the podcast is called Own Your Choices on Your Life. My second one is called Everybody Holds a Story. And I'm like contents going out four or five times a week easily. And the other thing is, is that I really over the last three years found a love for helping to share some of the NLP tools with people to learn how they can heal stories and how they can support themselves and it really was something that I decided to dive headfirst into. And so I created my own um, certification and it's called Outspoken because it seemed only fitting that I could name it after what I was constantly told I was too much as of a kid. <laughs> and so Outspoken, right, is this, is this, it's an NLP coaching certification, but it's really to help people to find their voice and learn how to share a story, share a vulnerable story. And now we're really venturing into, um, I work with a number of different authors who are trying to find a way to share a really difficult story in print. And, you know, how do I do that? How do I share vulnerably? How do I leave everyone in integrity? What does that look like? And now we're taking it into publishing as well. So I do both things on a regular basis and I obviously podcast a lot. So that's where you can find me. Brilliant. Marsha, you're an amazing woman. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very grateful that you found time today to, to join me and just make this world a little bit of a better place, one inf interview at a time. And we all have that. We all have that power. Um, so if you feel powerless, I, I give you a task today. I want you, wherever you interact, maybe go shopping, maybe fill up the car, maybe do something. Um, maybe do do a little little gesture, a little thank you, a little something that puts a smile on the face of the checkout operator, of the person who serves you in the in wherever you interact and see their eyes lighting up because you have shown you have showed kindness. So here you were, you think you're powerless, you're everything, but you just made the life of someone else better and it didn't cost you anything. How beautiful, beautiful is that? Beautiful advice. Isn't so it? beautiful. It's Absolutely. so beautiful. Mm. Yeah, it so, really is. Marsha, uh, I'm, this is not the last time that we talk. I know that for <laughs> sure. <laughs> so guys, look forward whenever we can create something, uh, some new content together. Part you will two. be the first to know, guys. But until then, Marsha, have a fantastic day. Look after yourself, okay? Mm, thank yeah. you so much for having me, Stephen. I love this conversation. And likewise. And you guys out there, live with passion. Bye. Bye. I never give up. I never give up. I never give up. Turn around.